The San Diego Musculoskeletal Project presents The Shoulder Physical Exam, Part 1, Anatomy. The shoulder exam consists of observation, palpation, range of motion, strength, and provocative testing. But an understanding of the functional anatomy of the shoulder is necessary before proceeding to the rest of the exam. We'll start with shoulder bones and ligaments. The two major bones of the shoulder are the humerus and the scapula. They articulate at the very shallow glenoid fossa. Two unique bony landmarks of the scapula include the posterior acromion and the anterior coracoid process. Both serve as excellent bony landmarks for shoulder procedures. Seen in context with the rest of the shoulder girdle, the scapula sits posterior to the sternum and ribs and articulates with the clavicle at the acromion. Two joints are formed with the clavicle, the medial sternoclavicular joint and the lateral acromioclavicular joint. We can also see the humerus articulating with the glenoid fossa at the glenohumeral joint. The glenohumeral joint is like a ball on a golf tee, showing very little, if any, inherent stability at the glenohumeral articulation. This shallow glenohumeral articulation allows the 360 degree mobility of the shoulder joint, but it relies heavily on static and dynamic stabilizers to prevent dislocation. One of the static stabilizers of the glenohumeral joint is the labrum, which is a cartilaginous ring that surrounds the glenoid fossa and deepens the socket for the humeral head articulation. The scapular coracoid process juts out anteriorly and attaches to the short head of the biceps and pectoralis minor. The coracoid also serves as a major stabilizer of the scapula, with numerous ligaments linking to the clavicle, acromion, and humerus. Notably, the coracoacromial ligament serves as one of the borders of the subacromial space. Finally, the acromioclavicular ligament and the glenohumeral ligaments overlie these joints and stabilize their respective articulations. The glenohumeral ligaments form part of the shoulder capsule, which, with the labrum, is another static stabilizer of the glenohumeral joint. From the posterior view, we see the bony landmarks are the clavicle and the posterior scapular spine, which help us place the muscles of the rotator cuff. The prominent acromion is a useful bony landmark for posterior subacromial bursa injections. Now we will review rotator cuff muscle anatomy which is the key to remembering many parts of the shoulder exam. From medical school, we remember the mnemonic SITS, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. We'll be reviewing each muscle's location and function so you can put them into the context of the shoulder exam. If you can remember which rotator cuff muscles are anterior and which are posterior on the scapula, their location helps you remember their function. To orient yourself when viewing the images, look for the coracoid on the anterior scapula and the scapular spine on the posterior scapula. The most superior of the rotator cuff muscles and the most frequently torn is the supraspinatus. It runs along the supraspinatus fossa of the scapula and inserts on the greater tuberosity of the proximal humerus. Thus, when it contracts, supraspinatus pulls the humerus in early abduction from about 0 to 60 degrees. However, past 30 degrees, the deltoid takes over as the more effective abductor of the shoulder. Infraspinatus and teres minor both lie on the posterior scapula and insert into the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity of the humerus. Thus, when infraspinatus and teres minor contract, they externally rotate the humerus. Finally, the subscapularis sits on the anterior scapula and inserts on the lesser tuberosity of the anterior humerus. Thus, when subscapularis contracts, it internally rotates the humerus. Together, the rotator cuff muscles are the dynamic stabilizers of the shoulder joint. As mentioned, one of the challenges of shoulder function is the delicate balance between mobility and stability.
The shoulder has static and dynamic stabilizers, which serve together to prevent anterior, inferior, and posterior glenohumeral displacement. As seen before, the two static stabilizers of the shoulder joint are the labrum and the shoulder capsule. The dynamic stabilizers of the shoulder joint are the rotator cuff muscles, which surround the capsule and provide stabilization at different points in the shoulder's range of motion. If the static or dynamic stabilizers of the shoulder are injured, the shoulder may be prone to instability, dislocation, and pain. To review again, supraspinatus serves in humerus abduction. Infraspinatus and teres minor externally rotate the humerus and subscapularis internally rotates the humerus. Knowing the rotator cuff muscles and their functions will be extremely helpful when you go through the rest of the shoulder exam, as many parts of the exam simply go through each rotator cuff muscle in turn. The last feature of shoulder anatomy we will review is the subacromial space. The subacromial space is bordered by the coracoid, the acromion, and the coracoacromial ligament. The contents of the subacromial space include the subacromial bursa and the supraspinatus tendon. Technically, the long head of the biceps is also in the subacromial space between the humerus and the acromion, but the biceps tendon runs through the bicipital groove on the humerus and joins with the superior labrum within the joint capsule. The pathology and causes of pain in the subacromial space are the subject of another talk. But knowing the anatomical boundaries and contents of the subacromial space helps you to remember potential causes of pain as you perform the shoulder exam on your patients. This concludes the review of shoulder anatomy, which was the first of our three-part shoulder exam video. Knowing shoulder anatomy will hopefully assist you to remember and interpret the multi-step shoulder physical exam, which we will review in part two, with observation, palpation, range of motion, and strength. And finally in part three, with shoulder exam provocative tests. Parts two and three of the shoulder exam videos can be found on the SD MSK Project channel. This video is brought to you by the San Diego Musculoskeletal Project. Thank you for watching.